How the banking collapse is part of the plan. Now, the second largest banking collapse in history just happened with First Republic Bank. Now, it's right behind the single largest bank collapse that happened back in 2008 with Washington Mutual. And while that sounds bad, and it is, it's really just the tip of the iceberg that shows us many important indicators that we need to be watching, and it signals a rapid shift in the U.S. banking system and fundamentally changes how the U.S. economy will work moving forward. And it's not good. So in this video, I will break down what just happened with First Republic, what happens with the depositor's money, as it gives us clues as to what will happen with our money and other banks. We're gonna look at the fundamental shift to banking, the long-term effects to the economy, and what we should all be watching and doing. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos to change the way you think about money, because almost everything you've learned is wrong. Almost everything you see and hear it's kind of wrong. And so I like to break it down so you can understand these things at a first principles level so you can learn to formulate your own ideas off of them so you can make the best decisions to manage your own finances so you don't end up owning nothing and being happy. All right, now, oh, I do want to just say just real quick, if something were to happen to me, I'd hate to lose you. So I have a sign up down below for my free email newsletter where I put um, a lesson in 10 minutes every single week I send it out there. I'd love to stay in touch with you. It's free. It's my newsletter. Just click on the link, put your email in there. I'll send you out just uh, some, I won't spam you. I'll send you out a couple little messages here and there with some insightful stuff I'm looking at just in case something were to happen to me on YouTube. But let's talk about what's going on with this banking crisis of 2023. We all remember, well, maybe if you're old enough, we remember the great financial crash the crisis of 2008, the banking crisis, and here we are in the banking crisis of 2023. And it may not seem that bad to you yet, but just wait till this video is over. Okay, so for a while I've been talking about the Fed breaking things, of course, they've gone on the fastest rate hiking in cycle uh, in history, and they said they would go until they broke something. Jerome Powell said, we would rather go too far and break things because we have the tools to rebuild them. And so they are, they're breaking things, and so the Fed, is broke. I've done videos about that. We can talk about it more. Leave me a comment if you want that. The Fed has now broken the treasury. And of course, the Fed has broken the banks. And we're seeing the banks dropping like flies. Of course, Silvergate Bank went down. SVB, we talked about that one extensively. Signature Bank. But now this one, the big domino fell First Republic. And to put this into perspective and size, here we have the largest bank collapses in history. Okay, in history. Now here we have Washington Mutual, which was $300 billion, that was in 2008. Now we have these three, we just named First Republic Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank, are the next three in line. So you can see, while we're not in the 2008 great financial banking collapse, maybe we kind of are. And if we look at it another way, this is directly from the FDIC website, what we can see here, is the green line right here is the total amount of assets that were lost in the banking collapse. The red line is the number of banks that collapsed. So what we can see, if we go back here to like 2008, 2009, we saw 25 banks collapse, 140 banks collapse, and 157, that's per year. So 300 plus banks collapsed during that period. Here we have uh, three banks three banks collapsed, and the total amount of assets lost dwarfs the amount of assets that we lost in 2008. So which one's worse, 2008 or 2023? Well, if we're looking at dollars, we can certainly see we are in a much worse situation than we were in 2008. All right, now in the First Republic a little bit, I don't wanna beat a dead horse. You've probably already watched the news. You probably already have most of this. So what I wanna do is tell you what's really behind all this. But to give you some of the basics, we have First Republic. Um, like I said, we saw that the assets lost were more than all the banks in 2008. All right, that's a pretty big deal. Now, to again, show you in uh, charts, I'd love to show you the charts so you can see the size and the magnitude of this. So here we have 2007, 8, 9, and here we have Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon, First Republic Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank. And so we are in a, big, a very big deal. All right, now what happens to deposits over $250,000? I get messages all the time from 
personal friends, family members, as well as lots of you, thousands of messages per week. What's going to happen with the deposits in the bank? Are they safe? Is the FDIC going to bail us out? Of course, I've made videos about that specifically, but in this case, deposits over $250,000, they're okay. And the reason why they're okay is because of FDIC insurance, but more specifically because good old JP Morgan. JP Morgan is bailing out the bank, they're bailing out the depositors, but that's only part of the story. All right, JP Morgan saves the day again. <laughs> again, so JP Morgan seems to always be there at a time of a banking crisis, always ready to bail you out, bail the government out, and of course, make themselves an obscene amount of money. Now, Jamie Dimon said that our government, the US government, invited us to step up, so we did. We were invited to step up, so why not? So why wouldn't they? I would probably do it. If, if you were given these terms, you might as well as, as well. So JPM generated a one-time gain of about $2.6 billion. Not bad for a day's work. They expect to make $500 million plus of profits per year. Now the FDIC covered the $13 billion in losses that the bank had, and they gave JP Morgan 50 billion in financing. So this is what we call privatized gains and socialized losses. So JP Morgan got a sweetheart of a deal, 2.6 billion, 500 million a year ongoing. The losses were socialized between other banks, the FDIC, and the financing even got socialized. Pretty good deal. You can see the statement here from the FDIC, JP Morgan, Chase Bank, um, decided to bail out First Republic. Now, I said again, because you have to understand the history of JP Morgan Bank. I've talked about them quite extensively because they are behind <laughs> the entire banking system. So you might know about the panic of 1907. Now this was before the Federal Reserve was created. Federal Reserve is in 1913. But we had this free banking era where all these different banks, kind of the wildcat of banking, and banks were going bust. They were making bad deals and there's a whole lot to that. If you, want me to talk, if you want to make a video about that, it's actually, it actually wasn't because of free market banking that collapsed, it was actually because of the government. If you want a video on that, leave me a comment down below, we can do that. But in the panic of 1907, these banks were collapsing and good old JP Morgan stepped up to save the banking collapse. As a matter of fact, it says uh, bad, uh, bad banking decisions and a frenzy of withdrawals. Sound familiar? The banks made bad decisions, in this case, bought a bunch of treasuries, the Fed raised the rates, they lost all the money, and a frenzy of withdrawals. First Republic Bank had over a hundred billion dollars worth of withdrawals. And of course, as I said, JP Morgan stepped up to bail them out. Of course, JP Morgan also stepped up to create the Federal Reserve in 1913. They were the number one bank behind that. They also stepped up to give all the money to France and England to go fight World War II. Uh, yeah, they're always there to lend a helping hand just in case we need it. All right, now, a lot of people, as I was reading through the comments and looking at this, a lot of people think that this is another case of how capitalism has failed. Now, if you're watching this channel, I know that's not you, but I wanna break this down for you anyway. Has capitalism failed? Well, let's see. JPM, JP Morgan, is technically not allowed to do this. So in a in any, in any market, we have laws, we have rules, we have regulations, and we have rules specifically to prevent monopolies from being formed like JP Morgan taking over all these banks. So technically, JP Morgan is not allowed to even do this deal. Of course, never let a pesky law or rule get in the way, I guess. So here we can see JP Morgan is among a small number of giant banks that have already amassed more than 10% of nationwide deposits. And because they have over 10% of nationwide deposits, they're not supposed to get any bigger. Making the firm ineligible under US regulations to acquire another deposit taking institution. Because we don't want these banks to get too big. We don't want to centralize the banking system. We don't want them to become too big to fail. We don't want them to have moral hazard where they know they can do whatever they want because they'll always get bailed out. But of course, again, never let one of these little pesky rules get in the way. And so capitalism didn't fail. As a matter of fact, it's cronyism, it's the banks and the governments working together that's causing the failure of the system. They were able to buy debt at a massive fire sale, enrich themselves privately, and then socialize the losses. The FDIC covered the losses. Now, I put this final point here because this is something that you need to understand. Central banks are communist. 
Now that's a big statement. Well, I don't have to go too far. In the original Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx, he gave 10 points of communism. In order to create a communist society, there's 10 things it must have. I'm not going to read them all, but point number five right here is the creation of a central bank. That's according to Karl Marx. That's not according to me. Now, if you'd like to know according to me, you could go ahead and buy my book, Shameless Plug. It's called The Uncommunist Manifesto. We'll put a link to it down in the description below, maybe a QR code up on the screen. Check it out. It's on Amazon. It's a bargain. Uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend you read it. All right, anyway, so that is communism. It's not capitalism that's failed the system. Okay, now, is this a byproduct of that or is this somewhat coordinated and planned? Now, I've been making a series of videos, so if you watch the channel regularly, you might already know this, but we know that small banks are going extinct, right? Where you see this consolidation where the small banks are going away and they're going to bigger and bigger and bigger banks. Of course, the large banks have much more capital, so they're able to acquire these banks. They're able to acquire the smaller banks. I see a post here um, from Lynn Alden. If you don't follow Lynn, you definitely should. And she showed this chart and basically shows the differences here. These are small banks cash as a percentage to their assets. And this is large banks cash on hand as a percentage to the assets. And what we can see here is this is a 2008 great financial crash right here. And what we can see is this rebound after 2008. And then of course, this is the COVID spike right here. And what we can see is the small banks have about 6% cash compared to assets, 6%. What we can see large banks right here have about 13%, more than double. And we can see that they've spiked throughout the time you can see that. But the point here is that the large banks have all this cash and they're in a position to continue to gobble up the smaller banks. Now, is this part of the plan? Well, it certainly looks like it. But I talked about how the Fed is on the fastest rate hiking cycle in history, wrecking with, uh, rising, raising rates with reckless abandon, causing them to go uh, bankrupt, the Federal Treasury, the U.S. Treasury to go bankrupt, and now the banks. The thing is, is that the Fed wants to continue on this warpath. They want to continue raising rates knowing that it's going to continue to put cause uh, stress onto the banking system and the banks will continue to collapse. However, as long as the big banks are there with lots of cash that can continue to absorb the smaller banks, then the Fed has the runway they need to keep raising rates. Now, this might be a good time to remind you that the Federal Reserve is neither federal nor do they have reserves. The Federal Reserve is not a part of the government. Yes, of course, they're sanctioned by the government, but it is a group of private banks. Now, who is the main bank out of the Federal Reserve banks? Of course, that would be JP Morgan, the one benefiting from all of this. All right, now, but this is a, this is a much bigger, scarier plan that they had. I recently did a video breaking down the banking stack in the United States, but I also broke down the banking stack of the world. And I made the case of how they're trying to collapse the banking stack so we can have a central bank digital currency for the entire world through the BIS and the IMF. We'll link to that video here. We'll put a link down in the description below so you can go watch that video. But basically, this is what it looks like. We have a central bank here. Under the central bank, we have commercial banks. And then the commercial banks have people like you and I that have accounts there. But what they're trying to do is consolidate these commercial banks to get us more and more direct to the central bank. Now for some math, 30 years ago, there were almost 11,000 banks. Today, there's barely over 4,000 banks. We have less than 37% of the banks that we had 30 years ago. It's centralizing. Now this is a big problem because we need a decentralized banking system. So we have decentralized banking rules and money creation. You might know, even though we talk about the Fed printing money, it's not how it works. The banks are the ones that create the money when they give you a loan for a car, a house, a boat, or whatever. And we need those decisions to be decentralized and localized. So my local banker has a relationship with me and knows what's best for my local area and can give me money as a small business. But if all we have is big commercial banks, headquartered in New York, they don't know me, nor do they know what my local area needs. We need those decisions to stay decentralized, but of course, they are centralizing. Now, 
I, I put this here, I thought this was a pretty interesting point, the inverse Jim Cramer. You know my Jim, you might know Jim Cramer. Uh, he's much more famous than me. He's all over TV, but he's always wrong. As a matter of fact, he's wrong so often that there's an inverse Cramer ETF that's been created. And almost every time he makes a prediction like, hey, I'm selling Bitcoin, Bitcoin's going to zero, Bitcoin goes up. Hey, I'm buying Microsoft, Microsoft goes down. Anytime he says something, it goes the opposite, and now people are literally betting against him, and it's beating the market. All right, so whenever Jim Cramer says something, we should do the opposite, and here he put out a tweet. Jim Cramer says the collapse of First Republic Bank could mark the end of the banking collapse. Oh no, watch out. If he stands the end, that means it's just getting started, something to watch out for. And this is a good illustration of exactly how it's happening. So we have here all these little individual banks right here, and they're all basically merging into these. So we have the big four banks, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. Now, of course, there's lots of other reasons we could dig into. Like, for example, it's much easier for the government to impose their will on just four banks than it might be on 10,000 banks um, and on and on. All right, so what does all this mean? What should we be doing? What should we be watching? What should we be expecting? Well, I would be watching what I'm expecting is for the Fed to continue to raise rates. Now, they're breaking things. They're going broke. Their treasury's going broke. The banks are going broke. Yes, but it's all part of the plan. The big banks are benefiting. They're getting to get larger. I showed you how much money JP Morgan's getting out of this. And so the Fed will continue to raise rates knowing that the big banks are benefiting from this and have enough reserves to weather the storm. We'd also continue to see that rules don't matter. This nation, which has been great for any number of reasons, one of which is because we have a rule of law. Other nations don't have that, which is why it attracts people and capital to this country, a rule of law. However, we're, we're very rapidly moving from a rule of law to a system that's ruled by men. And the men just happen to change arbitrarily whatever they want, whenever they want. And so we're seeing that rules don't matter. We'll continue to see that happening. Unfortunately, as we see this consolidation in the banking system, I believe it's going to continue to get harder and harder to get loans because now instead of this local relationship I have on this local decentralized decision with my local bank, now we have this giant corporate bank that doesn't understand us and wants to continue to push money to big businesses and not to small business owners like you and I. And ultimately what happens with this is a slowdown of the economy. As a matter of fact, Goldman Sachs put out a report this week saying that they expect the economy to dramatically slow down because of what's happening in the banking sector. So these are all things that we're watching. This is a fundamental transformation of the banking system. And this is just on the national level. It's happening on a global level and it's kind of scary. But what do you think? Is this something you're watching out for? Leave me a comment and let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up if you like this video. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down, that's okay. But at least tell me why in the comments down below. And please join my newsletter. I'd love to stay in touch with you just in case something were to happen to me. And that's what I got. All right, to your success. I'm out.